Optimal transport and information geometry provide two frameworks for understanding the distances between probability measures. Although these are separate theories, which were developed independently, it turns out that there are many connections between them. Furthermore, they both have applications in data science and machine learning. In this talk, my goal is to give a brief introduction to both, and to mention ways that they can be useful to practitioners actually working with data. Most of what I'll say today is contained in this recent survey paper, which I wrote along with Jun Zhang. I'll mention some references at the end of the talk, but we start by giving a brief introduction to both fields. Optimal transport was introduced by Gaspard Monge in 1781 as a question about military fortifications. In its original formulation, the central question was the following. We are given a pile of stone and must use it to build a castle. We want to find the most cost-effective way to complete this task. That is to say, we want to transport the material from the quarry to the worksite in a way which minimizes the total amount of work we need to do. In his work, Monge assumed that each part of the stone pile would be sent to a unique part of the castle. In other words, the transport would be induced by a map from the pile to the castle. And this seems like a simple question, but it turns out to be very difficult to answer. Instead, there's another formulation of optimal transport, which is much easier to solve. For this, we consider the stone pile and castle as probability spaces, x mu and y nu. Here, the probability measures describe the shape of the distributions. To encode a transport, we consider a coupling of the measures mu and nu, which we denote by pi. I should tell you what a coupling is. A coupling of two probability measures, mu and nu, is a measure on the product space, so that the marginal distributions are mu and nu, respectively. In other words, if we integrate pi with respect to y, so what remains is a distribution on x, the resulting measure is mu, and similarly for nu when we integrate with respect to x. To obtain the transport from the coupling, we consider di the disintegration of pi and distribute the mass according to the disintegration pi sub x. Intuitively, the disintegration gives the conditional distribution of pi for a fixed x value. In general, the point x might be a set of measure zero for mu, so we need to use the disintegration instead of the conditional distribution to make this precise. However, what we can see is that the mass at a single point x is split apart and distributed throughout y. In order to discuss optimal transport, we also need a cost function, which is the cost of moving mass from a point in the stone pile to a point in the castle. Mont supposed that the cost of moving a unit of mass from x to y is the distance between x and y. However, for many applications, it's preferable to use the square distance cost instead. And this is what we'll do for most of this talk. With these preliminaries out of the way, we can now discuss the Kantorovich problem of optimal transport, which is to find a coupling, pi naught, which minimizes the total cost of the transport. Here, capital pi of mu and nu denotes the space of all couplings between mu and nu. The advantage of considering this framework of optimal transport is that for very general costs and measures, an optimal coupling exists. Furthermore, Kantorovich showed that there's a dual formulation to this problem, and it's possible to solve the dual problem using linear programming. Shortly after Kantorovich introduced his work, the simplex algorithm was discovered by George Danzig, which gave a practical algorithm for solving linear programs. And for his insights, Kantorovich won a Nobel Prize in 1975. However, in general, the solution to the Kantorovich problem may split mass, and so not be a solution to the Monge problem. For instance, if mu has atoms, but nu is Lebesgue absolutely continuous, there will be a solution to the Kantorovich problem, but there are no transport maps at all. As such, the existence question for the Monge problem remained open for some time, 
and was fully solved less than 30 years ago. In particular, for the square distance cost, Yen Bernier found sufficient conditions in order to solve the Monge problem in 1987, and his results were generalized by Wilfred Gangbo and Robert McCann in 1995. Although this is a fundamental result in optimal transport, it's a bit more involved than the others I've mentioned, and the full statement is fairly lengthy, as you can see. In the context of Monge's original question, it's possible to give an intuitive explanation for what it says. If the stone pile and castle have the same dimension, the measures mu and nu are suitably well behaved, and the cost function c is smooth and non-degenerate, then the solution to the Kantorovich problem is actually a solution to the Monge problem. In other words, it does not split mass. Furthermore, the transport is given by the C subdifferential of a potential function U, which satisfies a particular PDE known as the Jacobian equation. Before moving on, there are a few points that I should make. First, the potential here is not U, so this picture should be considered a heuristic diagram instead of a precise image. Second, for the square distance cost, the C exponential terms which appear in the Jacobian equation correspond to something known as the exponential map on a Riemannian manifold. And this is where the name comes from. There are some very deep connections between optimal transport and differential geometry, but I won't be able to discuss them here in this talk. Finally, Munch's original cost function does not satisfy the third hypothesis of this theorem, which is one of the main reasons why the square distance cost is preferable. And that concludes the very brief introduction to optimal transport. There's much, much more that can be said, but these are a few of the central results in the field. Let's now turn our attention to information geometry. For this, we again consider two probability measures, but this time we want them to be defined on the same space. More precisely, we need one of them to be absolutely continuous with respect to the other. At each point in the space, we consider the heights of the associated density function, and then we use the following function to compare the heights and integrate over the entire space. Doing so, we obtain the kolbeck leibler or KL divergence, which is akin to a distance between the two probability measures. There are two things that I should know. This integral, describes the amount of information between these two measures. In other words, if the stone pile describes our prior belief, the KL divergence is the amount of data, measured in Nats, required to describe the castle, which would be our posterior distribution. Second, this is not a distance function in the usual sense. The KL divergence is not symmetric, so if we switch the roles of the stone pile and the castle, we get a different answer. Information geometry studies the underlying geometry induced by this notion of distance. This idea works particularly well for parameterized families of probability distributions. In this case, the parameter space is known as a statistical manifold. One of the key facts about this framework is that the geometry does not change if we change how the distribution is parameterized. As a brief aside, information geometry works exceptionally well if the parameterized family is an exponential family, in which case the statistical manifold has the structure of a Hessian manifold, which allows for much simpler computations of the geometric quantities. To give a rough heuristic, optimal transport measures distances horizontally by moving mass in between points. On the other hand, information geometry measures distances vertically by comparing the mass at each point. Trying to give an overview of information geometry would take several lectures and require some background in differential geometry. Instead, let's consider an example to give some intuition for how this works. Normal distributions are probably the most well-known distribution in statistics, and the family of normal distributions is a very important example in information geometry. In order to specify a normal distribution, we can specify the mean, mu, and the variance sigma. 
In other words, a Gaussian distribution depends on two parameters, and so the collection of all normal distributions is a two-dimensional statistical manifold. Intuitively, changing the parameters affects the distribution much more when the variance is small. For instance, these distributions are very different. But these are very similar, and we want some way to make that precise. However, if we use optimal transport and the square distance cost to compute the distances between these distributions, it turns out that the distance between these pairs of measures does not change. It remains constant. On the other hand, information geometry gives a different way to compute the distances, where the distance between the first pair of Gaussian distributions is much larger than between the later pairs. Using the KL divergence, there's a way to define a Riemannian metric, known as the Fisher metric, which can be used to compute distances, angles, volumes, etc. within the statistical manifold. Actually, this construction works for a much more general class of divergences, which are known as F divergences. However, for concreteness, let's just focus on the KL divergence. More precisely, the Fisher metric is the matrix whose components are the following. Note that in this expression, we are taking derivatives with respect to the parameters, not the points in the sample space. When we calculate the Fisher metric for the parameter space of normal distributions, in terms of their mu sigma parameters, we find the following. And if you've studied some non-Euclidean geometry, this expression might be familiar. It's the Poincaré model for hyperbolic space, ignoring that factor of two, which can be eliminated by scaling the variance. Changing the mean and the variance affects the distribution much more drastically when the variance is small. And this phenomena induces the normal family with hyperbolic geometry. Shown here is a geodesic in the space of normal distributions. And we can use these sorts of calculations to compute many other geometric quantities. I wanted this talk to be of interest to data scientists and to not just discuss mathematical results. So for the rest of the talk, let me discuss some takeaways that might be useful for people actually working with data. By using information geometry, there's a natural way to measure how different two distributions are. And this doesn't depend on how we parameterize the data or what units we use. For this reason, we can use this as a background geometry when we compute gradient descent. This is known as natural gradients and can be used to improve the convergence of gradient descent towards a local minimum. The one catch is that actually doing this requires inverting the Fisher metric. So instead, it might be preferable to use some approximation. Another important way in which these two areas combine is entropy regularized optimal transport. Most of the optimal transport problems we want to solve in the real world involve discrete measures. And while the simplex algorithm gives a way to solve these problems using linear programming, this can be very computationally inefficient, especially when there are a large number of points in each space. In order to speed up the calculation, instead of computing the exact solution to an optimal transport problem, we approximate it. For this, we consider the following regularized problem. Here, mu tensor nu is the product measure on x times y. In other words, the mass at each point in x times y is this the mass of the corresponding point in x times the mass of the corresponding point in y. By adding this extra KL divergence slash entropy term, the optimal transport problem becomes strongly convex, which makes it amenable to more efficient computation techniques. In order to explain the effect this extra term has on the problem, it is worthwhile to consider what happens when epsilon is either really large or really small. This is covered in detail in Gabriel Perez and Marco Cattori's recent book on computational optimal transport, which is an excellent re resource and is available online for free on the archive. When epsilon gets really large, the dominant term of this expression is the KL divergence. So the optimal coupling is essentially just the product measure, which splits the mass at each point in the source and distributes it throughout the target. 
However, as epsilon gets smaller, the solution to the regularized problem converges to the solution to the original optimal transport problem in the weak star sense. However, the solution requires more time to compute, so there's no free lunch. Intuitively, the entropy term penalizes solutions which concentrate too strongly, and so its solutions are more diffuse. This speeds up the convergence, both in terms of computational time as well as statistical closeness. And how much does this speed things up? Well, the computational complexity for linear programs is a pretty complex topic. But it's possible to construct linear programs whose worst case complexity is exponential. These are known as Clementi cubes, and there are many papers studying their properties. On the other hand, when the source and the target spaces both have size n, it is possible to approximate the entropy regularized optimal transport problem using something known as the Sinkhorn algorithm, which can find a solution which is at most tau from being optimal in big O of n squared log n over tau cubed operations. Note that it requires big O of n squared operations just to read the cost matrix. So this is fairly close to the theoretical limit of how quickly this problem can be solved. For this reason, Marco Cotori called this light speed computation of optimal transport distances when he introduced this algorithm. Thank you for listening. In conclusion, it's possible to work with entropy regularized optimal transport or natural gradients without knowing any of the mathematical foundations for them. However, I hope I've given some indication for why these theories might be useful to know if you are actually working with machine learning. And I'll finish up with some references for more detail. For your first introduction to information geometry, I would recommend Lewis Smith's blog post, A Gentle Introduction to Information Geometry. From there, either Frank Nielsen's An Elementary Introduction to Information Geometry, or Amari Nagaoka's methods of information geometry are worth reading, although I'd recommend having a differential geometry textbook handy as well. For optimal transport, Filippo Santambrogio's text, Optimal Transport for Applied Mathematicians, is an excellent introduction, which doesn't assume too much background. I've already mentioned computational optimal transport, but this is a really great book, especially for numerical questions and putting optimal transport into practice. Finally, Cedric Vaughani's Optimal Transport Old and New is basically the standard reference in the field and contains nearly everything you might want to know on the subject. It is very well written, but definitely a challenging read. This video was funded in part by a collaboration grant from the Simons Foundation.